How's Dragon Con going for everybody? It's <laughs> great. That's what I want to hear. So um, thank you all for coming. How many people have heard me speak before? Are, okay. <laughs> How many people have heard me speak about cryptos before? Okay. There's going to be a lot of new stuff in here because I got a chance to get into CIA for the second time in my life this year, uh, courtesy of CNN. So I'm going to be sharing a bunch of new information. No, we still don't know the answer to part four, but we do have some new clues. So I'll definitely be sharing all of that. Um, so for those who are uh, hearing me for the first time, welcome. Glad you're here. I love having lots of new eyes and new ears on unsolved codes because I believe that the answer to one of these may come from an idea that comes out of left field. Could be uh, someone who's never worked on codes, could be a little kid. Um, but just, yeah, I like having lots of fresh eyes on things. So, um, so my name's Ilanka Dunin. By trade, I am a game developer. I've, I've made a bunch of games, I've gotten some awards, Game of the Year award, um, and uh, yeah, I've been making game. I've been in the game industry for going on about 30 years now, and I've been coming to Dragon Con for about 20 years, and Dragon Con, have, yep, <laughs> you guys are my homies, um, and um, Dragon Con has really changed my life. It has provided the things that have, uh, you know, where one thing leads to another thing leads to another thing, and, and so my cryptography career started actually at DragonCon 2000. I, I think I got the, the old logo there for DragonCon. And what it was is I was speaking about computer games in the electronics track. And uh, as you know, speakers here at DragonCon, you get to know other speakers, you're at the track, you, at the end of the day you have a beer. And other speakers in the same track, in the EFF track, were hackers that were coming in and giving talks about security and how people should lock up their computers so that the bad guys couldn't get in. And, and through these hackers, I heard about this thing called the Freaknik 3 code, Freaknik version 3.0 code, that had been created as a challenge to the attendees at a hacker convention in Nashville, Tennessee, called Freaknik. Uh, and no one had cracked it at Freaknik 3. So the hackers were here at DragonCon and were handing out flyers with this code on it, the Freaknik 3 code, saying, hey, uh, if anybody can crack it, you win prizes. You get a free trip to a hacker convention, free hotel, free drinks, free t-shirts, free everything. And uh, I picked it up with all the other stuff you get at a convention. And I took it home with me to St. Louis, where I was living at the time. And um, it took me 10 days, but I cracked it. And uh, I won the prize. And um, then I went around cracking a bunch of other codes in the hacker scene. And I actually cracked so many codes that I was banned from competition <laughs> in the hacker scene. Uh, like at the Atlanticon hacker convention, uh, they released their code on a sheet of paper. And at the bottom of the paper, it said, note, past puzzle solvers are ineligible for prizes associated with the Atlanticon code. Give someone else a chance. Elonka. So, <laughs> so I cracked that one, too. And, um, and in these codes, in the Freaknik 3 code, there were, it, it was really written uh, like an onion, so you had to peel off the different pieces of the code, and there were dead ends, and there were red herrings in it. And one of the dead ends was a URL, a website address, to the CIA website, um, which had a picture of this sculpture called Cryptos. So that was the first place I heard about Cryptos, and uh, I took a look at it, and what is Cryptos, and I found out uh, it was a sculpture that had four different codes or ciphers on it. Uh, three had been cracked so far, and then the fourth one had not been cracked, and it was considered to be one of the most famous unsolved codes in the world. This is, this is what it looks like, and uh, 97 characters. And so as I'm solving the Freaknik 3 code, I'm like, oh, oh solve this next. Uh, oh, ha ha, famous unsolved code. All right, so it was one of the dead ends. Then I went back to the Freaknik 3 code and got to the rest of it. Um, and then after I cracked the Freaknik 3 code, I actually wrote a whole tutorial on it uh, that I put on the web and uh, have moved it around to different URLs as, as the web keeps changing. As a, as a side note, the, the person who had written the Freaknik 3 code had not made the uh, connection that the code might be solved by a woman. 
And, and so there was, a, when I got to the very center of the Freaknik 3 code, it was like 2 o'clock in the morning or something, and it, it said, um, congratulations, you've gotten to the center. Um, now you need to post an announcement of your win to this hacker mailing list. It was called root at se2600.org in southeastern United States, 2600.org. And I needed to post a message in haiku or sonnet format. Um, and, and announce my win. And, and uh, I needed to do it with the theme of why I liked to go swimming with bow-legged women and swim between their legs. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> so, um, so I did come up with something. The guy who wrote the code is a guy named Johnny X, who is a, a regular here at DragonCon. And so I wrote it in haiku format, which is, you know, five syllables, seven, five. And so I wrote Johnny X and I will discuss things aquatic if he wears a suit. So um, that, was, that was my announcement of the win, and it took him a month to respond, but he finally did, and then I won all, all the prizes, and then I went out cracking a bunch of other codes. So it was all just kind of fun and games at that point. But then something very serious happened, something very sad happened, which was September 11th. And um, this is a picture of the Pentagon there, and I have a uh, cousin, who works in DC, works at the, occasionally at the Pentagon, and he actually had a close call on that morning. Uh, and I, uh, he was having printer problems. And he uh, got his printer problems fixed, and then he's on his way to the Pentagon to give a briefing, and he was checking his cell phone for messages, and his phone actually crashed from all the messages from people that were saying, a plane just hit the Pentagon, don't go. And the, um, uh, and it hit where he was going to be. So some of the people he was supposed to brief were killed. And um, horrible, horrible day. And I went out a couple months later to hug my cousin. And um, and then we're uh, and we went to the Pentagon and we put an American flag there. And then he said, um, "This is your first time in D.C. Is there anything else you'd like to see?" And I said, "Well, no, just you." And he said, well, "That's nice. I like seeing you too." But is you know, there's kind of a lot of touristy things to see in D.C. Is there anything you'd like to see? And I said, "Well, I've heard about this sculpture called Cryptos. Um, maybe we could go take a look at it." And he said, "Okay, where is it?" And I said, "Well, it's kind of in the center of CIA headquarters, and and uh, you know, in, in Langley, Virginia." And he said, "Well, okay, let, let's figure it out." And this was a time where the, you, the, you couldn't just type in directions to CIA in, in, into the internet. There was no street address <laughs> for the CIA. And, and so we, you know, I kind of had to poke around. And I sort of knew uh, what the building looked like. You know, this is from Tom Clancy movies, where they looked down at you know, CIA, da 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 on the location. And I knew it was in Langley, Virginia. And so I, I kind of poked around and got some satellite pictures of the Langley, Virginia area and looked for this building. And I thought, okay, that very distinctive shape of the building. Uh, and so my cousin and I would figure we we're going to drive over there. And, and um, you know, we were just going to like find a service road, like drive around CIA. And uh, it didn't work like that. <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> we, we, we went down the highway and we, we took the exit, and all of a sudden, there's no service road. There's a gate with uh, big walls of barbed wire and a guard shack with a bunch of guards pouring out, holding guns, and asking a very reasonable question right after September 11th attacks, which is, who are you and why are you here? And we said, oh, you know, we're, we're just here to see the crypto sculpture. And they, they kind of relax a little bit and sorry, you can only get in with official business only. And my cousin and I look at each other and we're like, can we talk our way into CIA? And and so we start like you know, can, oh, we're really interested, and in, you know, can we, you know, can we just get in to see the see the sculpture? And the guards said no, official business only. We're, we're thinking like, well, can we get an invite from like our congressperson? And the guards said no, official business only. And we're like, um, is there like a family day? We could like pretend it was someone's cousin. And and the guard like no, official business only. And so finally, my cousin and I we gave away, and I'm thinking like, hmm. You know, official business only, official business only. And so now there's another part of my life going on, which is I was wondering if I could use all my experience with codes to help with the war on terrorism. So I, I did have contact with the, with the FBI in St. Louis at the time. And because I had all this game company and we had people were giving us credit cards because it was online games, and every so often they'd give us a fraudulent credit card number. So I'd be talking to the FBI, and I'd say, "Hey, you know, war on terrorism? Can I help?" And, and they'd say no. 
And, and so then, I, you know, I, every time I talked to him, I'd say, can I help, can I help? And finally, I got an agent who says, well, what is it you know about? And I said, oh, you know, I cracked all these codes in the hacker scene, and, you know, I've done, you know, PGP and UU encoding and steganography and binary. And he said, wait, wait, steganography? Um, and I said, yeah, steganography. Steganography, by the way, is a hiding a message inside of a picture. So you see the picture, but there's actually something hidden in the bits and bytes. And um, he said, the, the agent said, we've been hearing rumors that Al-Qaeda might have been using steganography as a way of planning the September 11th attacks. Uh, now, we're sure that there's big brains out in the Washington, D.C. area that know about steganography, but we're here in St. Louis. Cryptography really isn't our mission. Um, so maybe you could kind of come in and give a little talk about what steganography is. And I said, cool, you'd love to do that. And I think they thought I was going to come in and give a 10 minute talk, but I did like a 70 slide PowerPoint presentation <laughs> about steganography. And while I was putting the talk together, I was thinking that thing in the back of my mind, official business only, official business only. Hmm, maybe I can use this talk as a way of getting into CIA. And so one of the slides I needed to do in my talk was here's a picture of something without anything hidden in it. And here's a picture of that same thing with something hidden in it. What picture should I use? Should I picture of a flower or a beach or hmm, maybe I'll use a picture of crypto, so you know, the CIA sculpture. So I downloaded this picture from the CIA website and I hid something in it on my own computer. And then in a slide, I said, okay, here's cryptos without something hidden, here's cryptos with something hidden. So now, okay, so now I have this picture and I gave it to the FBI and they loved it and all around St. Louis, I gave it to the Secret Service and postal inspectors and uh, you know, just all, all kinds of, you know, Attorney General and all kinds of agencies there and it was, it was a big hit. And um, every time I gave the talk and I showed that slide, I would think, and I'd say, and I'd say, boy, you know, I'd love to give this talk at CIA someday. So I was trying to get a contact, right? And didn't work with anybody in St. Louis. But, and I went, and I gave a talk in Las Vegas at a convention called DEF CON. How many people here know what DEF CON is? Okay, so DEF CON is like the biggest hacker convention in the world. You got hackers coming in from all over the place. And I, I went to the, the speaker room at DEF CON and I said, hey, I, got this, I have this great talk on steganography. It's being really well received. Um, I could be an alternate speaker. And they said, okay. And so then I'm, uh, I'd never spoken at DEF CON before. And so then I'm kind of wandering around and seeing the talks on, at DEF CON. And I was at a talk, I think, on NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. And I got the, the call saying, hey, somebody else canceled. We'd love for you to give your talk about steganography. And I'm like, great. And then my heart's going boom, 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 boom. Because at, at some conventions, if you give a talk and you don't give a good, you, you don't know what you're talking about, people, you know, they'll give you a nice little golf clap, you know, and, and send you on your way. Not like that at a hacker convention. It, if, if they think you don't know what you're talking about, they will boo you off the stage. They will throw things, literally, throw things at you. They, uh, like ShmooCon has these schmoo balls that the, they'll throw at you. Uh, they hand them out. When you register, here's a schmoo ball. If you don't like the speaker, throw it at the speaker. So, um, it, you know, it's a thing. And so I was like, oh my God, I hope this is, you know, I hope my talk is up to snuff. And I gave the talk, it was well received. I actually got a standing ovation. And while I was giving the talk, I showed the slide. I said, boy, I'd love to get this talk at CIA someday. So, end of the talk, people come up to you and they give you business cards and things. And then some, one person came up and they leaned across the podium and they looked me in the eye and they said, I work at Langley, I think I can get you in. So there was someone undercover that was a DEF CON, just blew their cover. <laughs> and um, so I wanted to make sure that they were really CIA, they weren't just a hacker pulling my chain. And, and so uh, they gave me a first name and a phone number. And later on, I, I called the number and I'd sit and I said, hey, I'm willing to come give the talk at CIA as long as I get a chance to see cryptos. And they said, okay, send us your slides. And I said, wait a minute, you gotta prove to me that you're really CIA. And they said, how can I do that? And I said, well, send me an email from an official CIA address. And they said, well, I don't have an email from an official CIA address. And I said, well, get an email from an official CIA address. And a week or two went by, and then I got an email. It was from their name, at ucia.gov, which is unclassified CIA.gov. I wrote back to it to make sure that it was a real email address. They weren't just spoofing, so we had two-way communication. And then I sent them my slides. And, and they said, okay, come on in. Um, how much do you want to be paid? 
I said, I don't want to be paid. I just want a chance to see cryptos. And they said, well, we have to pay you. And so then I was like, oh my god, what do I ask for? Because if I ask for too much, then they'll say no, and then I won't get a chance to see cryptos. And, and you know, they're insisting. And I, was, I was agonizing about this. I was asking everybody, what should I ask for? And, and finally I said, look, I just want, um, you know, I'm going to be staying with my cousin. I don't need a hotel. Maybe I'll need a rental car. Um, cover my airfare. So $500. But if that's too much, it's okay. You know, give me a lower amount. And so then they came back and said, okay, you get, you're going to come in to see cryptos, and we're going to pay you $2,500. <laughs> so this is me negotiating with the government for your tax dollars. I'm just saying. Okay. So uh, I got into uh, CIA and I got a chance to see cryptos. And so it was like, woo, achievement unlocked, right? <laughs> I, I, I got in and, and while I was there, I was like, well, okay, what else should I do? Because I hadn't really worked on cryptos at that point. This is 2002, by the way. So I, I took some rubbings of the sculpture. Each one of these is a, kind of on an eight and a half by 11 inch piece of paper. And um, so it kind of gives you an idea of the size of the letters that are there. And then I took those home with me to St. Louis. Um, they made a mess in my suitcase. And, and then I thought, well, maybe somebody else might want to see these. And so I, I scanned them. They made a mess in my scanner. And I put them online uh, with a kind of like an early blog. You know, this is Yonka's visit to CIA in October 2002. And I, I put the rubbings there and kind of uh, some links to other places around the web. And then that web page changed my life because people started writing to me from all over the place saying, oh, you saw cryptos, what did it look like, and who's the artist, and, and just all these questions. And I'm kind of a, a helpful person, so I started making an FAQ about all these questions people were getting, what the answers are, and, and um, about the artist. People were asking me, like, who made it? And I was like, I named Jim Sanborn. And they said, well, what else has he made? And I'm like, I don't know. And so I contacted his agent. I said, can you give me a list of everything Sanborn's ever done? And the agent said, no, there, there's no such list. It would be impossible to make a list of everything Sanborn's ever done. Uh, sort of like official business, right? You know, it's impossible. So all of a sudden, boom, I have a new thing that I have to do. So I, I'll make a list of everything Sanborn's ever done. So I, I, I contact all the, like I contacted all the art galleries in St. Louis I could think of, and then I kind of widened until I found an art gallery that had, uh, had, had Sanborn's artwork in one of their exhibits. And there, I called them up and I said, hey, Sanborn was there uh, and, you know, whatever, 1999. And um, do you have any programs left from when he was there? And they go, oh yeah, we got 20 of them in the back. Would you like one? We'd be happy to send one to you. So they sent one to me and I looked and on the back of it said, Sanborn has also shown art at the following you know, galleries. So then I could call those galleries and do the same thing. So I've been like collecting all this information about Sanborn and building my website. And then I get a phone call from Jim Sanborn, and he's not happy. And he's like, who are you and why do you have a web page about me? And, and so I'm kind of like, hey, no, no, cool, I'm a big fan and I like your stuff. And um, so now we're, we're friends and I've been over to his house and I have a much larger website and I've been asked to give talks about the site and uh, I've been asked to write books about codes and that, that's, that's a whole other thing. And, and it all kind of ties into Dan Brown, who wrote a book called The Da Vinci Code, ties into that as well. But let me pause here for a moment. I know Scott here wanted to uh, interrupt because he wants to request donations for uh, the uh, Dragon Con's American Heart Association. And I'm going to fiddle with things because I'm going to be showing you a video. Um, by the way, did you know Dragon Con over 32 years has collected over $1 million in charity? So you can be part of it. So. All right, are, Ray, are we good for sound? We're not going to blow people's ears out? Okay. Scott, did you have any announcements you wanted to make? Yeah. Or? Okay. I'll let Scott do his thing and then I'll start the video. So I am uh, Scott Jones. I'm the director of the Electronic Frontiers Forums Track at Dragon Con. Uh, this year we are collecting for the American Heart Association. If you have, Way to go. If you, uh, if, if you have some spare change or an extra dollar or so that you could put in, I'm going to send the collection bucket around. If you could put something in, we would greatly appreciate it. And, uh, and I thank you. Thank you, Scott. All right, let's see if this works. This is a six and a half minute video. This is this year, um, CNN 
through their great big story division said had heard about me because of another code called the cicada cipher and um, while they were interviewing me about cicada cipher their camera guy was sitting in my home looking around and seeing all the crypto stuff that was on the walls and thinking hmm, we need to do a special on cryptos and uh, things went back and forth with their producer for about two years and uh, then earlier this year, uh, the producer, Drew B, contacted me and he said, hey, Ilanka, we got permission to get into CIA again to see cryptos. Would you like to go with us <laughs> to see the sculpture? To which my answer was, let me think about it, yes. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and so they, they did a great job. So let me show you their video. This is a story about I get emails from people now. They say, oh yeah, I was walking through this airport at Dulles Airport, and they're showing your video on, on the screen since you, you know, walked through, past the gate. So um, on YouTube, it went trending. It's got over 2 million views at this point. So I'm just kind of blown away with what they did. So let me go on and let me tell you more about what crypto says and uh, some of the things we know about it. So, um, that. No, no. All right, OK. So um, 1988, it was commissioned, dedicated 90. Uh, so Sanborn created it. The code systems were designed by the, the bald-headed man that you saw. That's Ed Scheidt, who was the chairman of the CIA Cryptographic Center. Um, some information about Sanborn. He'd never done a code, he'd never done an encrypted sculpture before in his life. Um, but when he got the gig to do cryptos, he did some research about the CIA, decided he wanted to do something with the the theme of encryption. Cryptos, by the way, is a Greek word, which means hidden. Um, now, how famous is cryptos? I have a, people would ask me, how famous is cryptos? And I go, well, there's, there isn't a list of famous unsolved codes. And OK, I'll make a list of famous unsolved codes. <laughs> so I uh, Ilanka's list of famous unsolved codes. And I, I try to be as objective as possible. So I put cryptos as number five. Other people might put it higher or lower, but I have it as five. And every year at DragonCons, uh, Scott, the, the uh, track director of the EFF track, invites me in to give talks. I've given talks about Beal and about Voynich. Um, Dora Bellard is just super short, so I kind of include that with other things. Zodiac Killer, eh, I could give a talk on, but it's, it's kind of gruesome stuff, so I don't like to give talks about the Zodiac Killer. And then you know, Cypher's going all the way down. So being more specific about what is Cryptos, it has four panels. Two of them are what's called a visionaire table, which is a visionaire, it's a, a polyalphabetic substitution cipher, um, where a keyword builds a cipher alphabet. The first key is the word Cryptos. So who solved the first three parts? Well, the first public solving was a guy named Jim Gologli, who was the head of the American Cryptogram Association. And then after that made international news, then the CIA came forward and said, well, we have somebody that solved those first three parts a year ago. An internal CIA analyst did it on his own time, pencil and paper, a guy named David Stein. And then the NSA came forward and said, well, we have people that have solved it, but we're not going to tell you who, and we're not going to tell you when. <laughs> right? A very NSA, no such agency. Um, so I, I kind of dug into that. OK, NSA guys, who, who did it? And I, found, I did find out that in 1992, they had a four-person team led by a guy named Ken Miller with Dennis McDaniels. The, the uh, most senior man that you saw in that video was Danny McDaniel, so he was part of that group. So I'm kind of reaching out and, and saying, okay, you solved the first three parts and you solved the fourth. Is anybody in the, nope, nope, no one solved the fourth yet. So getting more into the visionaire table, um, if you, if we're gonna start at that top left-hand corner, and this is gonna be a little easier to read. So you take the letters of cryptos, you take, the, you take a full alphabet, then you take the letters of a keyword, in this case the keyword is cryptos, you put that at the far left, and then the rest of the letters you dump to the right. So you still have 26 letters, they're just kind of scrambled in a very specific way. And in this you can read the word cryptos, and if you also read down the left-hand column of the whole thing, you also see the word cryptos. And that's, in this case that would be cryptos in two ways, but we're going to use a different key to make that part. So, Crypto's part one, the top two lines of the sculpture. 
And on this tableau on the right-hand side, you can see we have cryptos, but down the left-hand column, instead of the key of cryptos, we have a key of palimpsest. Palimpsest is a word for something, uh, say you have a, a message that was written on a scroll and then you scrape that message off and you write another message on it. So bits of the old message are showing through, palimpsest. You could also use that word for other things, for example, a city, the city of Rome is a palimpsest because you could be standing on a street corner seeing modern buildings, but you're also seeing the Colosseum. You're also seeing medieval churches. So you're seeing older buildings showing through the more modern. So, so that's what palimpsest is. So if we take the ciphertext from Kryptos, the first letters are E-M-U-F-P, right? And I don't know if you can see, is my mouth showing? No. So if you look at the red E and then an M, U, F, P, and you take that top red E and you go up to the indicator alphabet there, you have the letter B. And then you take the letter red letter M and you go up and you get the letter E. And so from this E, M, U, F, P, you get B, E, T, W, E, E, N, you get the plain text word between. So that's English. And you keep going and you'll get the full, uh, with cryptos and palimpsest, the full plain text, which is between subtle shading and the absence of light lies the nuance of illusion. Uh, that is not a typo on my slide. That is a typo on the sculpture. Though when I asked Sam Warren, is it a mistake? He has said, no, it's not a mistake. It's deliberate, but it, it's the orientation or the positioning. Um, However, this year, he said, well, maybe it is a mistake. <laughs> so, you know, he's, he keeps giving these, these different answers. So part two starts, the, the third line goes all the way down to the bottom of the plate. This is the ciphertext, and he was very specific. There was an error in this that, that he announced, which is at the very, very bottom right, there's an S that, that got left out, he said, for aesthetic reasons. Um, and so this one is the same method but with the keys of instead of cryptos and palimpsest, we have cryptos and abscissa. Abscissa is a mathematical term that means the x coordinate on a graph. So the plain text for this is it was totally invisible. How is that possible? They used the Earth's magnetic field, x. The information was gathered and transmitted underground to an unknown location, x. Does Langley know about this? They should. It's buried out there somewhere, x. Who knows the exact location? only WW. This was his last message, X 38 degrees, 57 minutes, 6.5 seconds north, 77 degrees, 8 minutes, 44 seconds west. We thought it said ID by rose, but it actually says X layer 2. Right? Don't know what that means. So part 3 starts at the top of the bottom plate, goes down to the fourth line from the bottom. This is the ciphertext. Some people may notice it looks a little different because it doesn't have as many Q's and Z's and X's. It has E's and T's and A's. So this is, instead of a substitution system, a transposition system. All of the letters are there, just scrambled in a very specific way. So one way that I figured out is if you put them all into these even rows, and you start at the far right, in the middle, you take that S, and then you count down by four, one, two, three, four, and you wrap around to the Second column from the right, you have an L, count down another four, you have O, and you keep going. So you get S, L, O, W, L, Y, slowly. And you keep pulling it out like that, and you get these lovely diagonals, right? And you get slowly, desperately. Desperately is misspelled because Sam Warren sucks at spelling. <laughs> um, and, and that comes out to slowly, desperately slowly, the remains of passage debris that encumbered the lower part of the doorway was removed. With trembling hands, I made a tiny breach in the upper left-hand corner. And then, widening the hole a little, I inserted the candle and peered in. The hot air escaping from the chamber caused the flame to flicker, but presently details of the room within emerged from the, from the mist. X, can you see anything, Q? Anyone recognize that? Okay. It's from November 26, 1922. An archaeologist by the name of Howard Carter. It's a paraphrased account of his discovery of King Tut's tomb. 
And the question, can you see anything, if you read his biography, the answer was yes, wonderful things, or yes, it is wonderful. So Sanborn has said that he liked that from the time he was a boy, the idea of, and he equates it to solving a cipher, that you're, sh you're sifting away the layers to get down to the actual plain text. So as I was doing research on what else Sanborn had done, making a list of everything Sanborn had ever done, I found out that after creating the CIA version, he had created another sculpture that he called the Untitled Cryptos Piece, which he had sold to a private collector. So I tracked down the private collector in California, and he had, he had placed this piece in his, in his backyard, um, and I called him up, and I said, hi, I'm Ilanka, and I'm researching, <laughs> and I, you know, can I come into your backyard and take pictures? And he said, sure. So um, you know, I got to see, and what it has is it has all of the text from cryptos on one side, and on the other side, it's a bunch of Russian text. So also the order in, in cryptos, if you numbered the parts, one, two, three, four, um, on this, the untitled piece, it's numbered three, four, one, two, three, four, and then I, I think it goes, it stops halfway through one or two. And Sam Ward made another piece like that, which is called Antipodes, which is at the Hirshhorn Museum. That's at the bottom right there. Uh, it's right outside, the, the big round museum. If you go to Washington, D.C., it's right outside the door. So uh, that Russian text um, is also on another piece of, of his that's called the Cyrillic Projector, and that was enciphered as well, but we, we, we put together a group and we cracked that part, um, and the, the parts are aligned differently. Also, there's, this is a picture of the untitled piece, and there's an area on it where there are two dots. So the letters are identical to what's on Kryptos, but the Kryptos does not have dots in those locations, and we're not certain why there are dots. We have lots of guesses, but we're not certain. If, if they were on Kryptos itself, it would be uh, the, from that top left plate towards the bottom right of that top left plate. So other, this is also some new stuff that we've been able to get a hold of, is that Sanborn has released pictures of his encoding charts when he created Cryptos. Um, this is how he, he encrypted it. So you'll see like the second section there, we have the word abscissa, which was one of the keys. And, and so he, there are arrows going, you know, we could spend like an hour talking just about this chart, but these are pictures that we've obtained. So you can slowly, desperately slowly is on that chart. Um, and this is probably the second step of the transposition of part three. So those coordinates, 38 degrees, 57 minutes, 6.5 seconds north, where do those point to? They point in the general area of CIA headquarters, but not to cryptos. And anyone who's done geocaching or has played with GPS coordinates, coordinates knows that 6.5 seconds north, a tenth of a second of latitude is a very narrow area, about 10 feet across. So it's not six seconds, it's not seven seconds, 6.5 seconds. And so it points in the area of cryptos. So the sculpture is in that courtyard outside the cafeteria. The white building is, is the cafeteria. And so people who are eating can look out the windows and they can see this whole area that Sanborn designed. And the uh, 6.5 seconds north is towards the bottom of that, that, that curved area where there's a, a grassy area, the 6.5 seconds points there, about 150 feet southeast of where Kryptos is. Right, here's another way of looking at it. All of this is public. Um, also, out front of the, uh, the, the new headquarters building, there's some other things that Sanborn has designed, which are these large slabs, like they're coming out of the earth, with uh, Morse code on plates in between the slabs. Uh, to give a sense of scale, the, the bottom one there, there is a large rock about the size of a bowling ball that is a lodestone. It is a magnetic lodestone. And another piece has a, a compass rose on it. So there's the lodestone there, and then the compass rose is about this big. And we've done things, you know, like where's the compass rose pointing? And he's done like two other pieces that have compass roses, and we've gone to look to see if they, no, they don't. But, uh, they, uh, but we have gone and investigated all of that. Um, here's another way of, of looking at it. So Kryptos is at the top left inside the uh, courtyard, and then there's a duck pond, and there's some slabs out there, and then there's slabs outside the entrance to the new headquarters building. One of them is this triangle block. It's about five feet in diameter, and I spent a lot of time looking at it when I was 
earlier this year in March, because it sure looks like it's pointing like an arrowhead. And, and I went and I was followed it as far as I could. Uh, it was March, so there, there, the flowers weren't blooming, so I was looking to see if there was anything, but couldn't find anything. So um, again, just the mystery there. Um, I spent a lot of time talking to Ed Scheidt, who designed the crypto systems. He said um, that uh, he did things to mask the English in part four, that we'd solved the first three parts because we have the methods of weighting the English language. We knew, you know, like E is the most common letter and T is the next most common letter. Um, but, and we solved them without recovering the keys first, but that part four, there was a masking technique of some sort, and we need to figure out that masking technique before we can solve part four. It's, uh, yeah, and he said he used a little bit of steganography, so whatever that means. Um, other things we've noticed is that on the uh, Visionaire Tableau side, if you go down the right-hand mm -hmm. column, E-F-G-H-I-L-L, -L. So it should go JL, but it goes LL. Why is it two Ls? We don't know. Um, and then there's alignment um, on the top. So the bottom plate, at the top left of the bottom plate, there are some letters that are a little out of alignment. So we asked Sam Warren about those this year. So something new is we said, does it, do those letters have anything to do with part four? And he said no, that they're related to one, two, three. He says it's not a misalignment, it's much more subtle than that. I can't tell you exactly what that means. I'm just sharing with you what he said. Um, also, the uh, picture of cryptos on the left, which is often used in, in various uh, books and whatnot, he says, that's the ugly side. That's the side view. And we said, well, what's the front view? And that's the one on the right here. That's the front view. That's the proper way. Um, Sanborn gets a big kick out of when he sees pictures of cryptos in math textbooks, like for kids, because he says he is not a math person. He calls himself an, an anathemath, I think is the word that he uses. Um, and when we ask him about doing frequent, frequency analyses and all these things, he says, no, nah, no, nah. he doesn't know anything about that. He's, he's, he can't spell. He can't do math. Um, he, he's not a code person. So how could he have created this cipher? And we think he probably did something weird to it, but we're just not sure. Um, so this is also something um, related to a clue he gave, and I'll get into that in a sec, is that he says that Berlin is a word that is in part four. So we spent a lot of time looking at what could Berlin have to do with cryptos. And it, Cryptos was created at about the same time that the Berlin Wall was coming down. And it's possible, we know that there was a Berlin Wall monument, this is a picture of it, that was being designed to be placed at CIA someday. So maybe it was going to be in the area of where the latitude and longitude coordinates were going to be placed. Um, we're not sure. Uh, if, um, so you can see in that courtyard, maybe it was intended to be in that courtyard where it actually ended up was outside the buildings where that road is at the very bottom and there's kind of a curve and that's where it ended up. By the way, for it, before anyone gets too excited about whether or not this is actual Berlin Wall, yes, the slabs are actual Berlin Wall, but when the CIA received them, they were blank. So they hired an artist to paint fake graffiti onto the slabs. If you'll notice, it's all in English, okay? All right, so, yeah, okay. Um, so back to part four, you know. So moving a little forward in the timeline, we had a discussion group about cryptos, and some people started joining the discussion group saying, hey, have you heard of this book called The Da Vinci Code? Because there's all these mentions of this thing called cryptos, and it's, there are puzzles. If you, if you have the American version of the hardback version of Da Vinci Code, there are five puzzles that are hidden in the artwork of the book jacket. This is something that Brown does where he is giving clues to the topic of his next novel. So in this area that looks like a tear, I don't know if you can see it in this lighting, but are the words only WW knows, all right? which is from part two of Cryptos, who knows the exact location, only WW. Um, though Dan Brown um, has tried to incorporate this into his own 
mythology. And when people ask him, what does WW mean? He says, well, maybe it's upside down and it means Mary Magdalene. Um, to which Sam Ward said, no, 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 no. That uh, w his intent was that WW means William Webster, who was the director of the CIA at the time that the sculpture was installed. Um, also on the back of the Da Vinci Code, very faintly on the left, light red on dark red, are the numbers 37 degrees, 57 minutes, 6.5 seconds north, 77 degrees, 8 minutes, 44 seconds west. So, um, so here's where my life took another change, is while The Da Vinci Code, a movie, was being made about the novel, and a publisher contacted me and asked me if I would create some ciphers for a book they were working on to come out at the same time as the movie. Um, and I said, sure, I'll make a few ciphers. And then they came back and they said, well, we, we need more ciphers. Maybe you could contact some of your associates. And I said, okay, sure, I'll contact them. And then, then the publisher came back and said, well, these are very difficult ciphers. Could you maybe edit that entire chapter on the difficult ciphers? And I said, at that point, I dug my heels in and said, wait, what? And, and uh, are you paying me for this? And then they said, well, really, we want you to write the entire book. <laughs> So, you know, I, you know I, I ended up writing the entire, with, with you know, much help from my, uh, from my colleagues. Um, and, and the book did, did quite well, and, and I sold some copies here at DragonCon. Really, this all started with DragonCon, so really very cool. So now we fast forward a few more years, and Dan Brown has written another book called Lost Symbol. So those clues from the Da Vinci Code, only WW knows, and the coordinates were giving clues to the fact that his next book would take place in Washington, D.C. And while I was reading this book, which did have cryptos in it, and then I saw there was a character in it named Nola Kay, which was an anagram of my own name. So it was Dan Brown's way of thanking me for helping him with some of the codes for his book. So, so that, was, that was super cool. Um, and this, okay, new information just released in June. They're going to make a TV series about the lost symbol taking place in Washington, D.C., and my character, Nola Kay, is going to be in the TV series. So I am super excited about that. I, I've asked who's going to be playing me, and uh, Dan Brown says he doesn't know yet. And I said, well, if I have a choice, I'd like it to be Angelina Jolie, <laughs> because I think she could capture my essence. <laughs> so moving on, uh, crypto. So. I uh, also want to just mention about the NSA effort, um, you know, why the NSA worked on it. And there was kind of this, uh, you know, hey, you guys are so hot, you know, let's see how hot you are. And they put together a team to create, uh, to solve part four. They couldn't solve part four, they wrote a memo. And so I contacted the NSA and I said, hey, I have this website about cryptos. Can you send me your information in that memo? And they said, well, no. And I said, well, why not? And they said, well, it's classified. And I said, why are efforts to solve a recreational cipher classified? And they said, well, we can't tell you. And I'm like, so I filed a Freedom of Information Act request. <laughs> So that I filed it in March, and you know, there's this long thing. You know, they in April they said, "Are you willing to pay search fees?" I said, "Yes." And then in June they said, "Okay, uh, you have been placed in the first in, first out processing queue for non-personal easy cases, but because there were cases ahead of mine, it might take a while. They wouldn't be able to respond in 20 days." So six months go by. I contact them again, and they say the case is actively being worked, level review, blah blah blah. Hang on, and then six another May of next year, and they, I'd say, how's it going? They say your FOIA is in the final approval stages. Another six months go by. They, again, your FOIA case is in the final approval stages. So I, I had friends in the government that were telling me, Ilanka, this is NSA speak for go away. And I said, well, too bad. <laughs> and so I kept contacting them, and then finally I got this big, thick manila envelope in the mail that would have redactions here and there. And at the top, you can see forward to Admiral Studeman for, for info. And at the bottom, it said, approved for release by NSA on May 21st, 2013, FOIA case 61191. That's me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so
so the, I put on my website and again, international news, and it, they had only solved the first three parts. There was nothing about part four yet. So a little bit more information. Uh, Sanborn did announce a hint in 2010 um, that the word Berlin was in there. And you know, we did a lot of, you know, is it Berlin? Is it the word? Is it the city? Is it like number of links? Is that Berlin? And so we, we were playing with that. And we found out we could get the word Berlin with, with Visionaire Cipher if we use the keys of shifted and binary, which is kind of cool. But there's nothing intelligible before or after that. We also found lots of other key pairs that would put Berlin there, like subcompact Gorky and other things that you know, just, just, yeah, didn't have, it works, but it didn't give us a plain text. So, um, so then uh, you know, continuing another year or so, uh, Dan Brown is, releases another book called Inferno. That's me all, all prettied up with Dan Brown and got a nice autograph there. And then another year goes by and we get another clue from Sanborn. This is the word clock. Um, and this year, something new, when we asked him about Berlin clocks, if he had a favorite Berlin clock, because there's all kinds of different Berlin, Berlin clocks out there, and, and we asked him what was his favorite, and he says he likes both of them. Hmm. Both of them. Like, what the heck does that mean? So again, this is just information we're getting. So this is a... Uh, so I had that one visit to CIA in 2002. The next one was in 2019. It was related to this little picture of the cicada. That was the interview that I was in. And then they went back and they said, OK, we got to do a thing on cryptos. Because uh, one of the cameramen was seeing all these pictures of cryptos around the walls. So I got in to see it again. That's me and Ed Scheidt, the guy who designed the crypto systems. This is in March 2019. And then I got to take all these cool new pictures, which was awesome. And I, I've got hundreds of these pictures. Uh, if you want, I'll give you the link and you can uh, yeah, go crazy on them. Um, we were, I was doing my best to get enough so that we could get a 3D model created. Uh, this, is, uh, this is more of the pictures of the guys, and this is, we're still playing with 3D models, but what we want to do is get a full 3D, 3D model so then we can test which way the light is showing and maybe shadows. And so this is some of the, the active stuff we're doing this year. Um, this is some more stuff that Sanborn, uh, when we were in his studio, uh, this clay material is from when he was at CIA. He, um, noticed that when they were shredding documents and then they'd mix them up with a chemical and they'd come up with like this popcorn kind of material and he noticed if he took that and mixed it with another chemical he could get this this clay and so he would make these wall hangings with this clay and then stamp other encrypted messages into this clay and, and so there's various wall hangings all around DC and, and uh, restaurants and uh, Federal Reserve and so we're trying to track all of those down to see what other ciphers he's used um, to see if those give us any clues. So this is um, in Sanborn studio. These are the people you saw in the video. The third guy from the left, some people that uh, know uh, tech culture, is the Mike Godwin, the guy who came up with Godwin's Law. Uh, so uh, yeah, so I drove him down there and he was kind of helping us brainstorm. Um, there's some other sculptures by Sanborn that we were tracking those down. This one on the right has binary all around it. Um, but yeah, this is the book that I wrote. There's another great documentary on PBS Nova Science Now. Um, and Q&A, what you got? <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Uh, if you do have a question, and uh, as long as you're able-bodied, please line up here. If you're differently abled and you need me to come out to you, then raise your hand. But we'd like to ask everybody to line up here. And I wasn't quite sure when this was going to start, so I would have had people lining up already. Oh, okay. we got about seven minutes, I think. All right. So if you'd like to ask a question, please line up here. Oh, and I do want to mention one other thing sure. that you haven't... Um, I haven't seen, but uh, it turns out that the NSA, National Security Agency, does have a building in Georgia. It's to the west of Augusta on a military base. I've never seen it in person, but I found it in Google Maps. <laughs> and the shape of the building is curiously similar to the shape of the crypto sculpture. Wait, what it is? Yes. <laughs> and if you, if you stretch out the sculpture, if you stretch out the sculpture along the line, <laughs> then, it, then it looks like the building. This is like, it's got these like S curves. So it's worth looking. I will help you find it, because I've, I've found it before. NSA building in Georgia. 
Where, where in relation to where? It's to the west of Augusta on a military base. Yes. Augusta. Thank you, Scott. And <laughs> it just occurred to me now, oh, I've seen that building. It looks just like Richard. Okay. So um, when it gave the coordinates, it also said second level. Did you guys get a chance to do any digging or flipping over any of the flagstones to see if there was something underneath? Yeah, the, um, uh, I have gone and stood at those coordinates. Um, it's, it's concrete that's there. Um, if it were a public area, I'd be doing <laughs> a lot of it. But since it's inside CIA and there's cameras and um, uh, <laughs> I didn't see anything unusual there. Um, I mean, there's tables, there's picnic tables you can drag around, and there's these little metal um, things about the size of this with a, a dash across it, which I think are, is so you can get down into drains and clear out drains when there's water and there's fountains around. Um, so, uh, no, and it, I mean, it says that layer two and CIA is not just one layer. There's layers above it and there's layers below. So there could be you know, maybe a layer down and something in ceiling tiles. Um, also, Da Vinci Code, he didn't say 38 degrees. He said 37 degrees, 57 minutes, 6.5 seconds north. And that area I did go to and dug around because there's a geocache that is centered exactly on that location. Um, but I didn't see anything unusual there either. But I looked hard. OK, mm -hmm. all right. Uh, so, I did a quick Google search when you said uh, to both clocks, and it seems like there's two clocks in Berlin. I was wondering, someone you also mentioned that they were like hiding the alphabet. I wonder if there are those misspellings, if you protrude non-English words, and then put it in front of the cipher, if that actually, because you, if you're trying just English words, you're not going to find mis like deliberate mistakes. Ask the question again. Okay, so <laughs> there are like two German clocks that, if you just Google Berlin clock, they come up. Uh, and so someone had mentioned that a clue was they hid the English language. Mm -hmm. Well, if they use non-English words and then right. put a lot of extra misspellings, does that help change the cipher at all? Yes. Like if you just like wrote a program that just protrudes characters. Right. right. Um, it, it is something that. Ed and Jim did talk about about should the answer be in some other language. You know, they could like there was a coffee shop with Assyrians in it, and they could have put it in, in some other language. But they decided that they were going to keep it in English. Um, but yes, that is a masking technique that could have been used. It's possible. Thank you. Hey, um, the only question I had. I'm pretty sure that you guys have already went uh, this route. But how many layers of encryption did you go through? So like you encrypt the message and then all he has to do is take the encrypted message and encrypt it again right. and encrypt it again. Right. So do you go two, three thousand layers in with the computer? It's, it's possible and there are, that is a valid encryption system where you start and you encrypt like the first word and then use its letters to encrypt the next, encrypt the next and go on and on yeah. and on. So it, it's possible and, and we've looked at it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Sanborn could come in and say, this is the method, these are the keywords, and it would still be difficult for us because there's so many different variations mm -hmm. of how you could do that. Like Visionaire, the American Cryptogram Association says, well, there's Quagmire 1 and Quagmire 2 and Quagmire 3 and Quagmire 4. Um, so it's possible. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. I was, uh, the question was how many layers did you actually go? That's all. Go ahead. Uh, I couldn't tell you exactly how many layers we've tried. Okay. I, I've yeah. got a couple thousand people that spend a lot of time on it. Yeah, it. yeah. It's a good idea. The last one, real quick. I've given I, that some of the uh, answers to the previous parts uh, dealt with light and shadow and locations. How confident are you that the final uh, clue is, is just embedded in the text versus? I, I couldn't hear you. The final clue what? Basically, how strongly do you feel that the final part of the puzzle is just the cipher text versus, like, is it like a sundial where on the vernal equinox the shadows are going to line up? It's, um, I mean, uh, Sanborn does love playing with light and shadow. There was a whole phase of his career that that's all he was doing was, was putting light, like graphs, on mountains in the southwestern United States and doing these long time-lapse photos. So, could be. 
Could be. You know, maybe we need to stand at those coordinates and shine a light and look at the way the letters project on the other side of it to get something. He does have a sculpture where he did that Cyrillic projector. You have to stand, it's a, it's a cylinder at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, where, um, and it's all Cyrillic text and it shines a light around the buildings. And if you stand at the right location, and look at where it's projecting. You have kind of Russian, 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 English word Medusa. Russian, Russian, Russian. I'd, I'd say and that, that English word is one of the keys. Okay. So. This I was piece by pretty cool. I'll call it down with Okay, so I've got one quick non cryptos question. Sure. In Fallout 76, in order to launch a nuke, you have to do a keyword cipher. <laughs> Did you have anything to do with that? <laughs> Fallout, is this from Bethesda? Yeah. <laughs> um, I have been through the fallout shelter that I think inspired that particular um, thing, but no, I have not personally helped them with ciphers. But if they said yes, I'd be there. <laughs> yeah, but it's a good question. All right, any other questions? Okay, all right, so summary. Um, my journey from games to cryptos was an unplanned adventure, and Dragon Con was what launched me on this adventure. So I, I owe a lot to Dragon Con. Um, so I told you about cryptos, has four sections, three of the four of it's solved. It's supposed to be solvable, and my own goal is not necessarily to solve it, but to help see it solved. So if you have a takeaway from this, it's don't ever let people telling you, no, that's not possible, stop you. Keep going and the search for what you're trying to do may be more valuable than the thing that you're actually seeking. Thank you.